I know I have a tendency to ramble on, so I'm going to keep moving quickly. Hey there, Fiber Junkies! Welcome back to The Color Cauldron. I'm Johanna, the owner and dyer behind Potion Yarns and host of this podcast. If you haven't had a chance to check out my shop below, or if you haven't checked out the most recent shop update, click the link below in the description box and it'll take you to my website, www.potionyarns.com, where you can see all of my hand-dyed yarns and fiber that I currently have for sale. You can also follow me on Instagram and on Facebook, Potion Yarns. I'm also on Ravelry as Potion Yarns, but I'm not super active on it, so if you um, want to get a hold of me, it's best to contact me through my email or website or through one of my social media outlets other than Ravelry because I'm bad about checking my messages. So today we have a lot of things to talk about. I'm trying some new stuff on the podcast. Um, I moved locations a little bit today, so we have a bit of a different backdrop, um, and I'm, I'm just going to be playing with some things in the coming weeks. So uh, bear with me while we try out some new things and see what we like, see what we don't like. Um, yeah, just trying to improve and learn and grow and try new things. So I wanted to share with you guys a couple of finished items that I have this week, and then we'll jump right into talking about our wool series. So if you follow me on Instagram or Facebook, you've probably already seen this first one, but I had to show it off on the podcast because I freaking love it. And I finished my Zweig. My Zweig sweater, this um, is a pattern by Caitlin Hunter of Boyland Knitworks. I follow her on Instagram and I'm obsessed with her patterns. Um, this was technically my second pattern by her, but the first pattern that I knit by her, um, I was knitting simultaneously with this one. I technically cast the other one on first and then cast this on before I'd finished it. So I was kind of knitting on two of her patterns at the same time. So this is kind of like my first time doing her, her patterns. But I love this sweater. Everybody was knitting it on Instagram and on Ravelry, and I've been seeing so many gorgeous finished items that I just decided I needed to join the trend. So when we went to Ireland back at the end of May, I packed several skeins of my Foxy Sock, um, and I'm using the Lady Absinthe colorway for this incredibly amazing chartreuse tonal. And then I packed one skein of the Foxy in the Stop the Presses, which is this amazing black and gray speckle on a white background, which is my contrast color. This sweater is amazingly fabulous. It fits me to perfection. It is so cozy. I just cannot wait for fall. It's way too hot to wear it right now. I modeled it in some photos my husband took of me last week or the week before. Um, so if you follow my Instagram, you've already seen this sweater because I posted the photos already. But just putting it on for like 10 minutes to take a couple of quick photos outside, I was like sweating and dying and ugh, it was awful. So. Unfortunately, I'm not going to get to wear it for a while, but I love it. It's so cozy and soft, and it's just amazing. It's, it's so phenomenal. If you've never tried color work before, this is a great pattern to learn on. Um, it's a little bit more complicated because the yoke has all of this lace, and I, I'm not going to lie, the lace is not crazy easy lace. So if you're a lace beginner, I still think you could do this sweater, but um, you might want to practice on a swatch before you get to the full sweater, or just take your chances and just be prepared to rip it back out. Definitely make sure you use lifelines, etc. If you're not new to lace, it, it won't be that tricky. It's really not that complicated. You just have to be a little bit more intentional about it. Uh, but the color work is super easy. Uh, you're only using two colors per row, and there's really only a little bit where you're actually using two colors. There's just a few rows at the top where you're striping, and then you do like a row where you um, bring in the, the contrast color. You do all of this in just the one color, and then there's really just this little color work down here. So it's mostly stripes and then big blocks of color. So the, the color work is extremely minimal, so you can definitely do it if you've never done color work before. It's really simple, and it's only that part. And then the body is um, really cool because it's like a stockinette background with those little butterfly like X patterns um, throughout the body and sleeves, and it's really easy and simple. So I highly, highly recommend this pattern. It's one of the best written patterns that I have done in a long time. There's absolutely no guesswork. She takes you through everything very, very simply and easily, even if you're new to sweater knitting. Um, it is done in the round, so there's very minimal sewing. In fact, I don't think there's any sewing. You don't even sew the underarms because you just pick up stitches. So it's really phenomenal. I highly, highly recommend it. 
And on that note, the other finished item that I have to show you today is also by Caitlin Hunter. This is the first thing I cast on from her patterns. And this is my Sunset Highway sweater. I was knitting this, um, or I showed this on the podcast when it was in Caked Up Skeins that I was thinking about casting on. And um, I started this in the airport our very first day headed to Ireland on our vacation in May. I cast on the yoke in, in the Kansas City airport. And then I knit on this, I knit most of this in Ireland. I just finished up the last little bit of it. Um, I did most of it, but the, the sleeves were a little bit long um, and I got a little bored in the stockinette body in Ireland um, because there were large amounts of time in the back seat of a car driving around for a while, a big stretch of time where um, I, we weren't really talking, we were just listening to music and whatnot. And I can only do stockinette in the round without having a movie on or reading a book at the same time for so long before I get bored. So it's great for, um, it's a really simple pattern as well with really simple color work, but it got a little old. So that's why I cast on my Zwag before I'd even finished. I had both of these and yes, I'm a nerd and a dork and I took two full size, big, long line sweaters to Ireland, having cast neither of them on before I left. Um, but I'm glad I did because I ended up working, getting most of both of them done on our trip and then I just finished up when I got home. Then they languished in the to be blocked pile for a very long time before I finally got around to blocking them. But I love it. If you are um, new to the podcast, you might not remember what yarns I'm using because you didn't see it. So a quick refresher, this top color is Madeline Tosh Merino Light in the Kale colorway. This purple, um, all the other colors other than the Madeline Tosh are from a set that I ordered from Machete Yarn Shop online. You can find her um, at her website online, which I'll pop a link to that below. But um, her purple and then this green is what sold me on the, um, the particular set that I got. This was one of her fading point kits. And then I did do something a little different with the body because each of her skeins, I just have one skein of each color from Machete Shop and they were in a, a kit for a fade shawl but I didn't wanna make the shawl that the kit was for. I wanted to make a sweater. And so this pattern normally would call for two skeins of the main body color um, because one skein is not enough. So what I did was I just started with one skein at the top and then um, after the color work section in the sleeve or about halfway down through the body, I faded in the second color because they were very similar. They both had a white background with like kind of pink and peachy and um, bluish kind of speckles. And so they were very similar. The speckle colors were just a little off and the top color has a lot more peach to it. And the bottom color is more of a white background with just some pink speckles. Um, and so they were very close, close enough that you can't tell unless you look closely that there's two separate colors, but I did fade them in where I'd knit with a couple, with one color for a couple of rounds and then knit with the other color for a couple rounds and then switch back and forth and then finish the body in the last color. So I love these patterns. Um, I will put a link to both of these patterns below and I highly recommend you go snap these up. They're really great. They're not that hard for how big they are. They actually go very, very quickly. So I highly recommend those. Okay. So, just to, I just had to brag about my awesome sweaters because they're amazing. But now I want to jump right into our wool series. Today we're going to be talking about a new fine wool that we haven't covered yet. And if you heard the opening statement to this video, you might already know what we're going to talk about. I apologize for the pun, but I couldn't resist. My husband came up with that great pun and I laughed out loud so hard when he first told it to me that I knew I had to use it on the podcast. So there you go. Um, but today we're going to be talking about Rambouillet wool. So what is Rambouillet? What, what do we want to knit with it? And why do we care? First of all, why do we care? Why do we care about these sheep breeds? Why am I doing this wool series in the first place? The reason I'm doing this wool series is because as knitters, crocheters, weavers, whatever type of fiber crafting, if you do any kind of fiber crafting with yarn, it is important to know what kind of fibers you're using. It's kind of like if somebody was just like, hey, here's a recipe to cook with and you just need to put some meat and vegetables and some oil and some spices in it. And that's all they said. Well, first of all, that tells me nothing about what kind of thing I'm making and also what kind of meat? Is it turkey? Is it beef? Is it is it ground beef? Is it steak? Is it bacon? Is it pepperoni? Is it, what kind of meat are we talking about? If they're just like, oh, just throw some veggies in there. Well, what kind of veggies? Carrots taste very differently from eggplant, taste very differently from potatoes, right? Um, and they all are gonna affect the outcome differently. And then if you're baking, it becomes even more difficult because you've gotta worry about percentages and all of that stuff. So you can't just be like, put some food in that recipe and make it. 
Well, that's kind of what it's like if you're like, well, I like to knit and crochet, but I don't really care what I knit with. I just want yarn. Well, you don't, you don't just want yarn. What kind of yarn do you want? Um, if it's going to be exposed to heat, you certainly don't want acrylic because that's going to literally melt right on your skin. Um, if you are going to wear a knitted dress, you're definitely not going to want to make it out of 100% cotton because by the time you finish the day, your dress is going to have turned into a cathedral length train behind you because cotton stretches so much. You're going to want to know what kind of thing you're working with. And just like with other types of fiber, not all wool is created equal. Um, wool is not wool is not wool. If you need a refresher and more information on why it matters what kind of wool we have, uh, I would highly recommend that you check out my original video that kicked off this series, What's the Deal with Wool, from about four or five weeks ago. It will answer a lot of your questions and talk about general wool characteristics. And then each of these videos is breaking down specific wool breeds and what makes them special. Uh, remember when we talked about merino sheep a couple of weeks ago on the podcast? We talked about merino and we said that merino came from Spain and that for a lot of years Spain kept merino kind of under lock and key. It was like their special commodity and other countries were starting to become aware of the merino wool and how incredibly soft and amazing and just awesomely versatile it was and they wanted to get their hands on it and Spain was smart and was like we have this amazing commodity we're not going to let anybody just put their hands on it and we're not going to export this just wherever we're going to export the wool and make a lot of money off of the fiber but we're not going to let just anybody raise the sheep so um, we even learned in the merino week that there was a uh, quite a heavy penalty for exporting merino sheep. It was illegal to export the sheep for a certain time period in Spain um, because they were trying to keep the control of the merinos where they could take control of it. Um, they didn't want to just let anybody have it and get their awesome commodities and make as much money as they could. Smart, right? So after a while though, um, Spain did need some more money coming in and they also didn't have the equipment to process the merino at such a high volume. De the demand was exceeding their supply and they didn't have enough um, processing equipment and areas that they could take care of it. They also needed more grazing land. So eventually they started exporting a little bit of their sheep to some of their neighboring countries like France. So in 1786, Louis XVI was king of France um, and if you are not familiar, Louis, just to give you a reference, Louis XVI is the guy that lost his head in the French Revolution with Marie Antoinette. Um, so Louis XVI was given 366 Rambouillet sheep from the King of Spain, and he took those sheep and immediately put them on a special royal super secure farm in Rambouillet, France, which is where we get the name. And uh, he was doing some research and development because the Rambouillet sheep actually were Merino. So what we know of as, as Rambouillet is like a, a dis, distant descendant of Merino. So um, the sheep that he was given were actually a specific breed, a speci bleh, excuse me, a specific strain of Merino. And the king of Spain gave him these Merino sheep and he was trying to um, maintain as much fiber and meat from these sheep as possible. So he wanted them to get them as big as possible and have the best quality fleece as possible. And so he starts putting them in, in uh, his Rambouillet farms, starts working with them. He loses his life in the French Revolution. We don't need to go into that sad, bloody mess. And, uh, but his sheep were pretty protected, so they survived the French Revolution. And um, from there, went on to continue to be develop being developed in France and started to take on their own characteristics. So they were very similar to Merino, but they had very specific characteristics. Partly because the Merino that they came from was one particular branch of the Merino family that had its own characteristics, but then, you know, as species tend to do, they evolved as they continued reproducing. And, um, after a while, they were integrated into Germany and then much later into the United States. Germany and the United States then continued to develop the breed with specific characteristics and qualities and really got them to the point where they are now the largest sheep breed in the fine wool category. If you need a refresher on fine wools, go back and watch my What's the Deal with Wool. We talk, <clears throat> excuse me. We talk all about the fine wools, medium wools, etc. So Rambouillet became the biggest um, sheep in the fine wool category, but still had that really, really soft hand, still considered a luxury fine wool. So that's kind of where they came from. Um, the cool thing to know, I thought this was really interesting, most modern day United States flocks um, in the western part of the country, most of our western US flocks of sheep 
are largely Rambouillet heavy. They have a lot of Rambouillet sheep in them, or they are some kind of Rambouillet crossbreed. Um, we are gonna talk about a couple other breeds later on that are going to be descendants of Rambouillets, like they crossbred a Rambouillet with another type of sheep and then created a different breed that has its own specific characteristics. And um, so Rambouillet are kind of like the grandpappy of a lot of the sheep in the US. So that's kind of cool to know. It has an 18 to 23 micron count, which if you remember, that's pretty fine. That's right up there with Merino. It's going to be slightly less soft than Merino, but only minusculely and it is going to have a lot more bounce to it than Merino. When we talked about Merino, I talked about how incredibly bouncy it was, and it is, especially when it's spun properly, prepared correctly, and raised in a decent way. It is. It really has great bounce, but if you like the bounce of Merino, Rambouillet is going to be even bouncier. It's kind of what it is known for. It has a two to four inch staple length, so it's not a very long staple, but it's decent. It's certainly in kind of that medium range, um, and because of its long staple length, that gives it a bit of variety when it comes time to spin the wool. So if you're a hand spinner, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, the crimp of Rambouillet is very, very fine and tight. So it is known for being even tighter than Merino. It's very, very springy and bouncy, and it's got a really even crimp. So there's not a lot of like up and down undulating waves like we had with BFL. It's more doo -doo 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 even all the way across all the way across the board very very tight very bouncy that's where the bounce comes from because it's packed so densely close together and it's so cushy and squishy um it also has a low luster which means it's not going to have that reflective shiny quality that like silk and blue face luster have it's going to be a bit more of a low luster um it's still gonna take dye beautifully, but it's gonna be a little bit more of an opaque, dense kind of a color, as opposed to like with silk, which has a very high luster, it's very, very shiny and reflective, and the colors just kind of glow and bounce off the skein. Um, so it makes it really good for like deep, rich shades with the Rambouillet. Uh, it does felt amazingly well. So you do have to be very, very careful when you are washing your Rambouillet because it has a reputation for being exceptionally easy to felt, which can be a great thing. If that's what you're looking for, Rambouillet is totally the way to go. So you wanna be very careful when you are washing your Rambouillet yarns because you don't want them to felt when you're not expecting it. So if you're not wanting to felt it, be very careful, use caution, even more so than you might with some other wools. So the yarns that come from Rambouillet wool tend to be very, very bouncy, very springy. They have incredible elasticity. And they're also very, very soft. So they're good for next to the skin wear. You can definitely use them for um, any kind of thing that's gonna be around your neck, cowls, scarves, etc. They're great for sweaters, but it has a really awesome memory and elasticity that makes it fabulous for garments and for socks and for anything that's going to need to really hold its shape well. It's awesome at that. Because of its bounce and its elasticity, without sacrificing the softness, that means that Rambouillet is incredibly awesome for blending with other fibers, especially fibers that need a little help in the elasticity department. So one of the ones I thought of that immediately comes to mind is cotton. Cotton has basically no elasticity, it has no memory. Um, if you stretch out cotton, it generally stays stretched, it doesn't bounce back, which is why earlier I said you don't wanna knit a sweater that's gonna be hanging from your shoulders out of 100% cotton usually, because that means that it's gonna just keep growing over time and you can't ever block it back once it grows out cotton can't go back so cotton blended with Rambouillet would be an awesome blend because it would really help to add even more durability and washability to the Rambouillet but it would give it all that bounce and elasticity to the cotton that you would really need I think it would also be really, really great with luxury fibers like silk that don't have a lot of elasticity themselves. Silk and Rambouillet would be an absolutely gorgeous blend. If you can find some, snap it right up. Um, anything like that. Um, I was also thinking of like cashmere and alpaca that tend to be extremely soft, but not quite as sturdy and not, you, bounce, bouncy isn't a term I would put with alpaca or cashmere generally. Um, they tend to need to be blended with merino or rambouillet or some kind of wool that has that extra bounce to it to give it that springiness and that liveliness. But a little bit of alpaca or cashmere or both in a skein with some rambouillet would be heavenly. So try looking for it with luxury fibers. You'll often find rambouillet blended with other luxury fibers. Um, you can also find it 
like I said, well, actually, I don't know. I didn't actually get around to researching, but I would imagine you could probably find it with some small amounts of cotton somewhere. It's probably gonna, there are probably some sock yarns out there that would have some nylon or polyamide or something with it that you could try looking for like a man-made blend with it. But anything that needs to benefit from bounce and elasticity while still having some softness to it, try blending that with Rambouillet or looking for a yarn that's already blended that way. There are some great Rambouillet wools on the market, especially from some of the commercial companies, but I did notice there are some other hand dyers that have it out there. I personally don't have any in my shop yet, but I'm really hoping to introduce some of that in the future. So if you would like to see some Rambouillet in my shop, please leave me a comment below and let me know. And if I get enough people asking for it, I might be able to bring that in in the future. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to talk about was for hand spinners. Um, we've been trying to incorporate just a little bit of information for the hand spinners on each of these series or for people interested in knowing more about the spinning process. So what would you do with Rambouillet wool? Honestly, you can do just about anything with it. Just like Merino, it is super versatile because it is soft enough to be next to the skin worn, but it has also got the bounce, elasticity, and strength that it needs to be used, um, especially if it's blended with a tiny amount of man-made fiber or something a little bit more sturdy. It's great for socks, for sweaters, whatever. So when you're spinning this, in general, it tends to do better because of its shorter staple length. It tends to do a little bit better when spun woolen as opposed to worsted. However, you can spin it worsted. You just need to compensate for the super tight, fine crimp by really twisting it tightly, and it tends to do better in applied yarn as opposed to a singles. So getting two or more plies and really giving them a tight twist when you spin is going to produce a much sturdier yarn and will give you a better result and a more even finished yarn than trying to work with a singles or doing more of a looser ply. I hope that will give you some inspiration spinners. I am pretty new to spinning, so I only have just the barest um, information to hand out to you. And then I would love to hear what your experiences are if you have spun with Rambouillet. So feel free to drop me a comment below and let me know what you think about spinning with Rambouillet. Or if you are a knitter or crocheter or weaver or any type of fiber crafter and you have experience with Rambouillet, drop a comment below, let me know. If you don't have experience with Rambouillet, you can still feel free to leave me a comment. Let me know if you're interested in trying it and um, anything else you want to tell me about this episode, what you liked, what you want to hear more of, etc. That's about all we have to talk about today. I just am so excited that I got to share the Rambouillet love with you today and share my new sweaters. I'm very excited and I can't wait for fall so I can wear them. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day and it is now time to cast off. Love you.